Good evening and welcome to this launch event, uh, this international launch event uh, for three uh, poets who are publishing books this month with Blood Axe. Um, we have Chen Chen, who is, uh, who is in uh, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. We've got Brenda Shaughnessy. No, sorry. <laughs> Brenda Shaughnessy is in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. Chen Chen is in Rochester, New York State. And Aaron Warner is in London. And they're going to read in that order. Um, Chen Chen um, is publishing his second collection of poems, uh, which has the wonderful title, Your Emergency Contact Has Experienced an Emergency. And um, his previous book was called, When I Grow Up, I Want to Be a List of Further Possibilities. Uh, which was published by Ladax after it was published in the States, um, did very well. Um, his work relates very often, very much to the experience of being a queer Asian American, living through an era, era of Trump, mass shootings and the COVID-19 pandemic in the States. He was born in China, but grew up in Massachusetts. Um, we'll be able to hear much more about that from him in the discussion at the end. Um, but we'd like to start off with Chen Chen, and I'll introduce um, the other two poets in turn as, as they come on. So welcome, Chen. Thank you so much, Neil. It's great to be here and to be reading with um, Brenda and Aaron. Um, thank you so much to Black X Books. Um, thank you to everyone for attending. Super exciting to be launching the UK edition of my new book. So I'll start off um, reading, I think, the bunch of the season poems in this book. So there's kind of the series of poems that are all titled um, after seasons. And a lot of that came out of uh, moving to West Texas for a PhD program. And um, having grown up in New England, in Massachusetts mainly, um, the change in landscape and in climate um, and in culture uh, was really huge for me. And so uh, most of the seasons um, in here, there are a bunch of summer poems and a bunch of winter poems because it kind of felt like those are the only two seasons when I was living in West Texas. Um, but there is one um, spring and one autumn poem. So I'll be reading from that series to start us off. This is called Summer after Sarah Gambito. I have a canoe that gives me therapy my insurance won't cover. The man I love calls from Colorado, unaware of my canoe. It offers a better kind of cognitive behavioral in very turquoise water. The man says his mother is dying. And I say, I know, but nothing is clear. I pay the canoe with my best Christopher Walken impressions. It becomes clear that Colorado is where all calls are from. How did I not know? He says his mother has a couple of months. The canoe says to eat five cookies, then canoe off the calories. He says he saw snow in New Mexico on his way to Colorado. I see how my past is a nun who knows a lot of state birds and my future is a pancake shaped abyss. He says his sister is having a child. He says it's snowing and his sister is pregnant and his mother is dying. So they probably won't be able to go on as many rides at Disney. I say, okay, and I see, but neither is true. The sky shuts its geese-filled mouth. Between the canoe and me, there's no more discourse. I wait for him to come back. I wait for Colorado to go away. This is also called Summer. Um, and I think all you need to know is that Jigglypuff is a Pokemon who's very pink and round and sings um, his enemies to sleep. He's like always carrying a mic around. Um, and Jigglypuff evolves into Wigglytuff, 
and maybe from the name you can tell that it's um a tougher um version of jigglypuff um the line that that occurs in is also a reference to a Britney Spears song and I'll let that reference sit with you however it goes summer you are the ice cream sandwich connoisseur of your generation. Blessed are your floral shorteralls, your deeply pink fanny pack with travel sliced lint roller, just in case. Level of splendiferous in your outfit, 200. Types of invisible pain stemming from adolescent disasters in classrooms, locker rooms, and quite often Toyota Camrys, at least 10,000. You are not a Jigglypuff. Not yet a wiggly tough. Reporters and fathers call your generation the worst, which really means queer kids who could go online and learn that queer doesn't have to mean disaster or dead. Instead, queer means splendiferously you. And you mean someone who knows the common flavors for ice cream sandwiches in Singapore include red bean, yam, and honeydew. Your powers are great, are growing. One day you will create an online personality quiz that also freshens the breath. The next day you will tell your father, you are wrong to say that I had to change. To make me promise I would. To make me promise and promise. You know, this is one of the winter poems in the book, and um, grackles are a type of bird um, that are very common in West Texas. Winter. The grackles flap dark and showy into my sleep. I know they are only my synapses, sparking pretty hallucinations but still they flaunt their rough and many consonants. Kellogg's, lacuna, grief counseling. These are the sounds they like to make. Then they ask about my mother and father, whether I've spoken to them lately. In this way, they're just like my boyfriend. I tell them my cell service is terrible. That I often think of switching. And then the company texts me, thank you for being a valued member of our community. The grackles say to speak more slowly. They're still learning human. It starts to snow and I wish I lived alone in Paris or maybe in my parents' house without my parents. My boyfriend's mother lives in a box. My boyfriend lives with his mother in slow, not quite stories during breakfast. I wish I wasn't tired of his sadness, but I'd rather look at the snow falling like silver confetti, another pretty thing my mind can make. I wonder if I'd be a better person if I learned to speak bird. The grackles say I should learn to pick up the phone. I ask for a different assignment. Call, the grackles say, call back. And I'll read just one more winter poem, and then I think the autumn poem for now. Winter. You become increasingly indoorsy. In the middle of Coco and Tori Amos, you remember your mother calling back once after you hung up on her. She said, you're just like me, saying things you don't mean when you're angry. At the time you agreed with her, liked being like her, or that she thought, said you were. This afternoon, you believe another nap will solve all your life problems. When everyone knows naps are better suited for tackling geopolitics. In a dream, you try and fail at starting a dream journal over and over. Up again, you make tea, put on some Britney. You stare out the kitchen window, out at the frozen yard, into the wind-faced hill and you whisper, feel better. Then you think you're saying no, 
I meant them, not every word, but every sound. And the last one that I'll read now is Autumn. <clears throat> Very fitting for the moment. And there is an epigraph from Basho uh, translated by Sam Hamill. Autumn approaches and the heart begins to dream. My heart comes back in a very large FedEx box as though it has accumulated many new possessions. But no, it is just surrounded by a lavish amount of bubble wrap. Kneeling on the carpet, I lift it out and feel for a moment like I've won a raffle, though I don't recall buying a ticket. Then I bring my heart up to my face and find it giving off a mystery odor, like a relative you want to have to buy a bus, no plane ticket to see. Yet this pounding is undeniably me, demanding a flawless performance of the entire Lion King soundtrack, asking, does the moon ever get sad? Needing to know, does the moon get terribly sad because it is simply called the moon and not some fancy Greek name like the myriad moons of Jupiter, like Callisto, for example, from the Greek Kalistos, superlative form of Kalos, meaning beautiful. Then knowing the moon does not get sad, or at least not because of that. Of that, the moon is terribly proud. Thank you. Thank you, Chen. And, um... Tim was showing you his new book, and I should give a name check to the artist who did the cover illustration, which is Muriel Ling, and it's called Shadow and Ghost on Black Water. And this is the, uh, this, the, the British edition looks very different from the American edition, doesn't it? Okay. Yeah, I um, love the different covers. They yeah. turned out nicely. Thank you. Okay. Um, and now we're going to have Brenda Shaughnessy, whose cover is an amazing painting by Jessica Rankin. Um, Brenda is of um, Okinawan, um, sorry, I'm getting a bit mixed up here. <laughs> Okinawan Irish American heritage. Um, she grew up in Southern California. Uh, she's published five collections in the States. And this is her first um, selected poems. It's a new and selected poems. It's not published in the States. It's only published in the UK. And um, so please, would you welcome uh, Brenda Shaughnessy? Thank you so much, Neil. It is such an honor to be here with Aaron and Chen and Neil, of course, and Pete. Thank you to Blood X Books. You're amazing. This is a dream. I also noticed something very interesting about our names for this program. Uh, I, I miss pronouncing Aaron's name wrong in order to make this, but it rhymes. Bren, Chen, Aaron. Um, I just thought we had to, I had to, I had to point that out in case it was going unnoticed. Um, anyway, this is, this is just a, um, a delight to be here with you. So thanks for listening. I'm going to start with a poem called Artless, which is an interesting kind of contronym in itself, the word artless, because originally, in its old fashioned usage, it means innocent, guileless, somebody without any kind of um, ulterior motives. Um, but the way we use, use it now sort of means like with no art or without um, sort of ungraceful, but it didn't used to have that. Uh, this is artless, is my heart. A stranger berry there never was, tartless, gone sour in the sun in the sunroom or moonroof, roofless, no poetry, plain, no fresh special recipe to bless. All I've ever made with these hands and life, less substance, more rind, mostly rim and trim, meatless, but making much smoke in the old smokehouse, no less. Fatted from the day, overripe and even toxic at eve. Nonetheless, in the end, if you must know, if I must bend, wasteless to that excruciation. No 
marvel, no harvest left me speechless. Yet I find myself somehow with heart, aloneless, with heart, fighting fire with fire, flightless. That loud hub of us, meat stub of us, beating us senseless. Spectacular in its way, its way of not seeing, congealing dayless, but in every dayness. In that hopeful haunting, a lesser way of saying in darkness, there is silencelessness for the pressing question, heart, what art you? War, star, heart? Or less, playing apart, staying apart from the one who loves, loveless. Here's a poem from my first book, which was the only book, it was called Interior with Sudden Joy, and it was the only book that was available in the UK um, until now. And that was published 20 years ago, over 20 years ago. It was published in the last millennium. What's uncanny is the body's wiry edge, singed and dried, touched at last by the curious gloves of the question guard. Too much choreography. Hamstrings, half edible and music, stretched like cat gut, the sad animal pull. Our knees, two peculiar systems of locking, of looking, too little dance. Compulsion is always narcissism. I miss you, admit it. I'm gifted, I give in. I give you all my old synesthetic fire. Loved body smoke is terribly popular in dry neighborhoods and our lungs are succulents. We share this loss of breathing. Listen for it. So I had a poem um, published years ago in the New Yorker and it, it's called, uh, I Wish I Had More Sisters. I got more mail from that poem than and everything else combined people wanted to tell me all their stories about their sisters. They wanted to tell the dirt, they had the gossip. It was just, I realized like, we are not talking enough about this. I got a little bit disturbed at some of the stories. I wasn't entirely sure what I should do. I wish I had more sisters. I wish I had more sisters, enough to fight with and still have plenty more to confess to, embellishing the fight so that I look like I'm right and then turn all my sisters one by one against my sister. One sister will be so bad, the rest of us will have a purpose in bringing her back to where it's good with us and we'll feel useful and she'll feel loved. Then another sister will have a tragedy. And again, we will unite in our grief, judging her much less than we did the bad sister. This time it was not our sister's fault. This time it could have happened to any of us and in a way it did. We'll know she wasn't the only sister to suffer. We all suffer with our choices and we all have our choice of sisters. My sisters will seem like a bunch of alternate me, all the ways I could have gone. I could see how things pan out without having to do the things myself, the abortions, divorces, the arson, swindles, poison jelly. But who could say they weren't myself? We're so close. I mean, who can tell the difference? I could choose to be a fisherman's wife since I'd be able to visit my sister in her mansion, sipping bubbly for once, braying to the others who weren't invited. I could be a traveler, a seer, a poet, a potter, a fly swatter. None of those choices would be as desperate as they seem now. My life would be like one finger on a hand, a beautiful, usable, ringed, rung piano and dishpan hand. There would be both more and less of me to have to bear. None of us would be forced to be stronger than we could be. Each of us could be all of us. The pretty one, the smart one, the bitter one, the unaccountably happy for no reason one. I could be, for example, the hopeless one. And the next day my sister would take my place and I would hold her up until my arms gave way and another sister would relieve me. All right, I'll read two more and they're not long. Um, this is um, from the new section of the, of the book. This is Moving Far Away. And 
and it's a pretty different vibe. So I don't know how to kind of whoosh, whoosh, like change the scenery or something. Um, moving far away. I hear they're trying to make borders in water now to declare it a place, impose a shape, dissolve the solvent. It's no solution to our probable problem. I'll never see you again, I say on my cell. Said to myself, we'll be well below alone now. Can I be a good friend to you if I move so far away? Haven't seen you in years, but I like a rough edge. Island broken off a big bully. I'll use up all my firewood on you. Sorcery, what turned into me? An iron foot, a leg of log, a wish for symmetry. My fire handed down to me by cauldron witches in their longish, unauthorized youth. Broken crest rising, rinsed of desire, full of pull and push, no rush to finish or to vanish. As if water didn't wave and bring tidings and answer me like an animal, jealous, crushed, washing herself. I'll never forget, you told me never to forget, but I did. Your voice, a needle, threaded, headed for my open wound, already burned clean for a clean split. And I'll finish with a poem called Artisanal. Aren't we sick of that word? Um, I started with artless and I will end this, uh, this session with artisanal. Bring your own bread, your breath, your open mouth. I'm sorry, bring your own bread, your breath, your own mouth open all night. What wouldn't I give to fill it? I can't see my breath yet catch it again and again like a magic coin I use to buy myself back from the self chamber box, that dank fromagerie again and again. In its dark robe worn open, the night, blind prince of the black cat, has a page for us all. What wouldn't I give to fill it? Such is the dreary unwritten history of hunger, of what to say to stay alive. We don't write it down. We can't keep it down. Why bring it up? Burn it all down. Make it new. A real writer makes do. Famous last words. Not even ink makes the best ink. Wine better spreads a stain and the mouth is already wet. The better to contain a fire or catch a fish or tell a story sharpening the point of the last meal. That incredible question, star of dread. My own words eaten like a cheese requested for the death of it, ending my sentence and the one after it. There's always one after it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brenda. And um, Brenda's actually going to be in Britain uh, next week. She's reading in London on Tuesday at the LRB Bookshop. On Wednesday, she'll be in Newcastle at NCLA. And then um, she finishes doing um, uh, Outspoken at Southbank Centre. And if you want details of those readings, uh, go to the Black's book website where you'll, you'll find all that information. And you'll be hearing again from Brenda and Chen after we've heard from Aaron and then Aaron will finish off the event. So um, the next poet to read will be Aaron Warner, and this is his latest book, which is his fourth collection. Um, I'm, totally, I'm totally killing your vibes. And the cover picture is from one of his multimedia projects. He's a poet who works across different art forms. And this new book um, is called uh, One Part Phantasmagoria, One Part Brutal Document with Equal Measures of Irony and Sincerity. It's a very unusual book with uh, long um, sequences in it. Um, and I'll ask uh, Aaron to join us now and to introduce it. Thank you, Neil, and um, thank you, Brenda and Chen. It's amazing to read with you. Um, as Neil said, this book is a book of sequences. It's a book in three sections. Um, the middle section is actually a book of three further sequences intertwined. Um, I'm going to start by reading five poems from this middle section. The, the section is called I'm Totally Killing Your Vibes. And all five poems are from a sequence um, that, that doesn't have a title now. But in an earlier iteration, it had the working title 
customer feedback, um, which you'll, I think, see why. A man I have met twice has taken a dislike to my latest book. It seems he is quite knocked or knocked enough to write about it in a periodical of some reputation. Lols, huge lols. I'm alerted to this by Twitter. My girlfriend wakes to find me chuckling heartily my girlfriend is less amused. She dislikes his charge of misogyny. She dislikes my use of the word slut, being taken for what Judith Butler might have called the public display of injury. I dislike my citation of Ginsburg and Yates being taken for original lines. I'm not that good, I say. He should really be better read if this journal wants to keep its reputation, I say. And then, lols. And then we really laugh, because the man I've met twice seems to think what he writes matters. That writing matters. That anybody really cares or reads what he or I write. And that is like super lols. Silly man we say, though he does have a poem about ponies, I say, and my girlfriend rolls her eyes. The aging burger of Blackpool, from whom I've bought a vintage 28 millimeter camera lens says, I'm a triple A plus plus buyer. And I think that's who I am. I'm a triple A plus plus buyer. And I slip and slither into the bathroom of this once grandiose Ukrainian hotel to check myself out in the mirror. And I take off my boxes and socks so I can see the entirety of my triple A plus plus buyer's bod. And I admire the way the scales on my strange reptilian muffin top glint and glitter in the 25 watts that flicker on and off and on to reveal my delicious tail and my complete lack of nipples. And I extend the rather significant length of my forked tongue, which is also my nose. And I lick and sniff the length of this smeared and flaking Soviet era mirror. And I lick and sniff the length of my own reflection and I shiver and trill at the taste of iron and coca and strychnine, which is also the taste of myself, which is also the taste of money. The poet laureate of the state of Oklahoma does not like my new book. This is not how Salan does it, writes the poet laureate of the state of Oklahoma. And I think, no shit. And then I think, how does Salan do it? And then I think, hurless and with the unbleachable stain of living. The independent bookshop I like very much has started to follow me on Instagram by which I mean a very beautiful and painfully modish woman who runs it has started to follow me on Instagram. Following anyone on Instagram is also a form of affection. The beautiful and painfully modish woman likes me, I think. She likes me, I say to myself. And then I think of how well connected she is how many launches of obscure photography monographs she hosts, how many events for cult but highly influential fashion magazines. And I think how she likes me. And I think maybe this means we can meet IRL. And I think how she might introduce me to the editors of cult yet highly influential magazines. 
and I shiver and I beam at the promise of being at the center of a six page editorial of nothing but me and me wearing those Balenciagas, the ones that look like socks and wry erudite captions that say, Aaron is wearing a Dior tux and those Balenciagas, the ones that look like socks as he lounges on an Eames inspired custom made beige velvet podium and discusses Proust with a small Bengal kitten named Lydia. And this is the last poem I'll read in this set. Um, if all of the poems in this sequence deal with feedback in some way, this might be the underlying rationale for this poem, but it's more a poem about anxiety born from reading a poet you greatly admire writing on your work. And it's for Vani, Anthony, Ezekiel, Capaldeo. Vani Capaldeo has written an extended review of my latest collection of poems. Vani Capaldeo is one of my favorite poets, so this is a big deal. This is a pretty big deal, I say to my friend of this review of my latest collection by Vani Capaldeo that I still haven't read. Why haven't you read it, my perplexed and very short friend inquires, and I say, I lose hours each day with my finger hovering over the clicker and the unclicked cursor hovering over the hyperlink that will take me to the page on which I'm concerned that Varney Capaldeo has laid my inadequacies burr. I spend much of each day immobile. I've fallen and landed in an overrated Kubrick film in which, as always, I'm the star. And Varney Capaldeo has placed calipers on my eyes. And Varney Capaldeo has forced my eyes towards a screen on which Varney Capaldeo has bound my hands and placed me on a large, lustrously gilded fish smoker. Varney Capaldeo is smoking me like trout. And when I'm smoked, Varney Capaldeo takes an unusually strong thumb and equally unyielding finger. And Varney Capaldeo is pinching me just below my pelvic fins and curling away the crisp of my skin. And Varney Capaldeo has taken a fish slice to the pink of my flesh, has pulled away the first of my fillets, is teasing my spine, is lifting my skeleton from what's left of my body. And now Varney Capaldeo has snapped my spine from my dis embodied head and that unusually strong finger and thumb are pressed inside the back of my fish skull and my trout eyes and trout lips fill the screen as Varney Capaldeo moves a finger and thumb together and apart so my trout lips are moving like a talking trout and I'm little but the bodiless head of a smoked trout miming the words I'm bad you know it really really bad you know I'm bad I'm bad though without the fishiest hint of irony and my trout face is mouthing shimon as a nutterable confession thank you thank you aaron and to add to the self-referentiality of this event i can tell you i don't know if you knew that varney capodeo is actually watching this <laughs> from edinburgh <laughs> um Yes, so let's go back to Chen to um, do his second set. Uh, Chen, welcome back. Hello, it's been great just to be listening. Um, these poems, just, yeah. So glad to be here and looking forward to the discussion as well. Um, so for the second set, I'm going to read... Um, just three poems, one of them's longer. Um, and these are from a set of poems in this new book that are all titled The School of Something, um, in part because I was in um, a PhD program as I was working on these. Um, and I went right from an MFA program into that PhD program, which I do not recommend to anyone, <laughs> so much school. Um, and so this first <laughs> school up poem is called The School of More School. God is a honey flavored extra strength cough drop. 
I also, <laughs> I would get sick like clockwork at the end of every semester uh, when I was doing the PhD coursework. So this is also kind of about that. I'll start again. God is a honey flavored extra strength cop drop. I am another attempt to confess. I have not read Ulysses. God is a webinar on how to be closer to your CV. I wear faux leather, but engage in some real kinks. I talk to my neighbor's cat. I carry two pencils and one purple pen at all times. I can't decide whether the university is a refuge for the bookish lonely or a t-shirt store run by a soda company. Late at night, I go out to check my mailbox as though a present has just been delivered. Tonight, a handsome bundle of air. Tonight, I am not my mucus. God is how difficult it is to stay calm. <clears throat> um, so also these poems, I'm thinking about uh, learning, sources of learning, how true learning can sometimes or often be um, in tension with institutions and um, formal ways of learning. So um, I got thinking about while in a PhD program, um, what are all the other sources of knowledge in my life and also um, not knowing, right? mystery too, um, but also um, living in West Texas at that time, 2015, 2016. This is called The School of Logic. I love you, your cheese at stained mouth. I love you, your legs, two furry examples of eternity. I love you, your love of instruction manuals, original packaging, the step by, don't throw it out, don't you want to know how it works? I love you, your logic, your try it. You're reaching for my hand again in the South Plains Mall, Lubbock. Your flirty eyes in this AC oasis of mostly shoe stores. I don't love my refusing to reach back. My logic of what if they spit, what if fists, how I see every look and think we're too much love even like trying on shoes side by side. How I can try on these clearly gay sneakers yet still leave a buffer between where I sit and you. How I've read and never thrown out these instructions, their love for telling me under there, under that under, that's where your family can see you. But how I love you, you're seeing, you're grinning. Hey, you're soft, come on, hold my hand. As we pass the kiosk of aggressive t-shirt peddlers, the squawking crew of college boys, you're it's all right, you're, I'm here, you're, fuck it, and quick grip, and before I know it, your logic, more beautiful than mine. <clears throat> the last poem that I'll read, I should take a sip, oh, this is so fitting, it's Snapple, which is um, a prominent image in this next poem. And um, I make reference to this um, supermarket chain um, in the US that's primarily in um, upstate New York, New York State, um, called Wegmans. And it was because um, when I did my MFA, I was living in Syracuse, and that's where I met my partner. And um, everyone <laughs> would always be talking about Wegmans. And I was like, what's the big deal? Um, and then it is it's like, it's an amazing um, grocery store. Um, and I found myself missing it when I was living in West Texas. Um, and then when we moved to the Boston area after I finished um, the PhD, um, I found myself missing it again. So this is yeah, written after living in West Texas, but it looks back on that time. The School of Eternities. Do you remember the two types of eternity, how we learned about them in a Wegmans parking lot when you turned on the radio, the classical channel? 
Why were they even talking about eternity? What did it have to do with the suddenly broody guitars? You had a peach snapple. I remember the snappy kissy sound of the lid coming off in your hand. One type of eternity, they said, is inside of time, as endless time, life without death. We were inside our Toyota. I said, we need a new umbrella. Do you remember when we first rhymed? Do you remember the first time I asked you about the rain, the expression, it's raining cats and dogs, whether it was equally cats and dogs falling? Can you remember when you learned the word immortality? The hosts on the classical channel were okay. I thought you'd do a much better job. I remember saying so while you drove us home, our apartment, our third. Remember the day we moved into our first, the boxes of books and boxes of books, my books, are sweating up three flights of the greenest stairs and you said, never again, and the again and again, and the other type of eternity is outside of time, beyond it, no beginning, no end. I remember your hand, the lid, your hands, the steering wheel, your lips, your lips, the way you took a sip, gave me a kiss before starting to drive. Do you remember the first time you drove me home, before home met where we both lived, the books on the shelves, the books in the closet, when I ran out of shelves, the second closet, the second apartment, West Texas, remember the dust, the flat, another type of eternity, that dusty sun. And driving to the supermarket, what was it called there? And that hand soap we'd get, which scent was your favorite? I don't remember what it was called, can't remember exactly the smell, but your hands after washing, I remember kissing them. Don't you remember when we thought only some things were ephemera? Can you remember when you learned the word ephemera, the word immortality? Probably the latter first, and isn't that something, immortality first, than menus and movie tickets? When was the first what was the first nickname, the fifth umbrella, the type of taco you ordered on our 16th trip? Remember driving, remember when we thought the world of the world. Remember how I signed the letter explodingly yours. Do you remember you were driving? We were halfway home, only eight minutes from Wegmans. Remember when we measured distance in terms of Wegmans, like it was a lighthouse or pyramid or sacred tree? Remember when your name was Fluttersaurus Vex and mine? wasn't. Remember when I lived like a letter, falling in cartoonish slow-mo down four flights of stairs. Did you picture a letter of the alphabet or a letter I'd written to you? Remember when I asked you about the rain, when the wizard jumped out, when I lied and you laughed, when I lied and I lied and I lied. Can you remember last night how I crossed my arms as though dead and arranged just so, how I pictured my face polished as though alive? And no, you can't remember that, since it happened while you were sleeping and I wasn't. I was up, wondering why people always talk about death as sleep and how much I love sleep, hate death. And have I told you about the student who said, I'm really, really afraid of death, just like that, in class. It was fitting because it was poetry class. Ha ha. And I loved it, her saying that. I wanted to say I loved it, but couldn't. I was thinking about you sleeping and me not, about me sleeping and you not, and what even is outside of time, beyond, then, now. No, thanks. I prefer the type of eternity where we are inside, are us, and last night's movie, good, not great, a stray piece of popcorn still under our coffee table. Do you remember when the world signed the letter yours ephemerally. Remember when I asked you about the rain, the cats and dogs of it, if it was 50% cats, 50% dogs, 100% falling, and you said, of course. And you said, she's gotten, the flight's not till, I'm going to drive. I remember you driving to your mother, West Texas to upstate New York. You didn't make it in time, she had little time than none. 
I remember your face pressed into my shoulder. I remember your mother was an endless, a question your face asked into my shoulder, how I wanted it to answer because I couldn't. I didn't go with you when I could have. I chose a poetry reading instead. Thought she'll be there, you'll be. Is memory the best eternity we can make? The only. And you said it's equal, the cats and dogs raining down, though in terms of overall volume. The rain, it's all the different breeds of cat, dog, and see, there are more individual cats since there are more very large breeds of dog. The cats have to balance things out with their number, but the dogs, don't you worry, they're raining down too, and they're rain. Absolutely, there's still rain, the cats and dogs. Lots of water for the plants, for the flowers, for the whole street in our dusty car windows, for the cats and dogs on the ground, the cats and dogs that aren't rain, at least not yet. And maybe that's another eternity the rainy type. I remember you drove us home. The radio was on. We made a sound like a lid coming off. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And now we'll have a second set from Brenda. Um, I love that. I love hearing this and then I get it and then it's just yeah and then I have to hear myself again. <laughs> um, Chen I love that I remember um, uh, beginning I think that's so I think it's so it, it generates so much I love it. Um, anyway it's still an honor and a pleasure and I'm going to start um, with I have a time machine um, and so do we all, it's, it's us. I have a time machine, but unfortunately it can only travel into the future at a rate of one second per second, which seems slow to the physicists and to the grant committees and even to me. But I managed to get there time after time to the next moment and to the next. Thing is, I can't turn it off. I keep zipping ahead. Well, not zipping. And if I try to get out of this time machine, open the latch, I'll fall into space unconscious. And I'm, I'll fall into space unconscious, then desiccated. And I'm pretty sure I'm afraid of that. So I stay inside. There's a window though. It shows the past. It's like a television or a fish tank, but it's, never live, it's always over. The fish swim in backward circles. Sometimes it's like a rear view mirror, another chance to see what I'm leaving behind. And sometimes like blackout, all that time wasted sleeping. Myself, age eight, whole head burnt with embarrassment at having lost a library book. Myself, lurking in a candled corner, expected to, expecting to be found charming. Me holding a rose, though I want to put it down so I can smoke. Me exploding at my mother, who explodes at me because the explosion of some dark star all the way back struck hard at mother's mother's mother. I turn away from the window, anticipating a blow. I thought I'd find myself an old woman by now, traveling so light in time, but I haven't gotten far at all. Strange not to be able to pick up the pace as I'd like. The past is so horribly fast. So I'm going to time travel back to 1998 with Dear Ganglia, which is a reference to an even earlier time. I think one of Sappho's um, loves was Ganglia. Dear Ganglia, the most inscrutable, beautiful names in this world always do sound like diseases. It's because they are engorged. Gee, I am a fool. What we feel in the solar plexus wrecks us. Halfway squatting on a crate where feeling happened. Caresses. You know, you know corporeal gifts besmirch thieves like me, but she plucks a feather and my steam escapes. We're awake each night at penny moon and we micro and necro. I can't stop but love and what all. The uncomfortable position of telling the truth, like the lotus, can't be held long. 
if she knew, would she just take all her favors from my marmalade vessel and chuck them back into the endless reversible garment, which is my life? An astonishing vanishing. Gee, I know this letter is like a slice of elevator accident. As smart folk would say, everything is only nothing's truck. I would revise it and say that everything is only nothing, truncated. Love your Igor. Oh, this is a brutal one. Um, Nachtraglichkeit. And I'm not going to read it in German. I'm going to read it uh, in English after Kaja Silverman's amazing book, Flesh of My Flesh. Nachtraglichkeit. On having slashed myself from throat to instep in one unbroken line. I suppose it was a reenactment. Freud's Nachtraglichkeit, the second act. The past presses so hard on the present. The present is badly bruised. Blood brims under the skin. That was the situation I was in. Wearing a jacket of blood from an earlier crime, which was also mine. A curving zipper with misaligned teeth to show, open to show red lipstick, meat, and a stage smile, have a seat. Normally, I'm much more careful. Naturally, something like this would only ever happen in a dream. But even dreams have their dreams of finding their dreamer awake, silent within earshot, carving knife in hand. Did you know that anguish thins the blood and thickens the vessel? It was like cutting a rare steak, a minotaur glittering with rubies and pink candles. My hands hung like electrical wires off a building on the edge of collapse. Every one of my gestures symbolic, ruined of magic. For there is no miraculous beast, and there never was standing on the golden field of frozen honey clover. Each leaf, leaf strong enough to bend under everything's weight, strong because it bends, because it's already been crushed. But its cells know that blight, one massive cut, will slit each tiny skin surgically in order to save the field from itself. I cannot suffer the same fate twice, force my own hand or stay it can't repeat or unrepeat. This finitude is infinite and infinitely expanding. I'm going to end with identity and community or there is no I in C. This is a true story. I went all the way to Hawaii to write and to swim in the Pacific Ocean on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. Um, and then I was all afraid to go in the water. Identity and community. There is no I in C. I don't wanna be surrounded by people or even one person but I don't want to always be alone. The answer is to become my own pet, hungry for plenty in a plentiful place. There is no true solitude, only, only. At Seaside, I have that familiar sense of being left out, too far to glean the secret. How go in? What an inhuman surface the sea has always open. I'm too afraid to go in. I give no yes. Full of shame, but refuse to litter ever, I pick myself up. Wind has power, sun has power. What is power's source? There's no privacy outside, we've invaded it. There's no life outside empire. All paradise is performance for people who pay. Perhaps I'm an invader and feel I haven't paid. What a waste to have lost everything in mind. Watching three mom-like women try to go in, I'm green, I want to join them, but they are not my women. I join them, apologizing. They splash away from me. They're their pod, people are alien. I'm an unknown story, erasing myself with seawater. There goes my honey and fog, my shoulders and legs. 
what could be queerer than this queer tug lust for what already is, who already am, but other of it happens? That kind of desire anymore? Oh, I am that queer thing, pulling and greener than the blue sea. I'm new with envy. Beauty washing over itself. No reflection, no claim, nothing to see. If there's anything bluer than the ocean, it's its greenness. It's its turquoise blood mixing me. I was alone. I was a woman alone in the sea. Don't tell anybody, I tell myself. Don't try to remember this. Don't document it. Remember, write down to not document it. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. And now we will have a second set from Aaron Warner. Hey. Um, I'm going to read uh, the first seven poems from the opening sequence of this book. Um, I was thinking back and Neil sent me an email when we were working on this book a few years ago now, where he described an earlier version of the manuscript as half pain in the arse, half pain in the heart. Um, that first reading I gave was probably pain in the arse. This is more pain in the heart. Um, the other thing to say is that this sequence, the sea is spread and cleaved and furled, was originally written in tandem with making a film. And the part that I'm going to read became uh, some of the voiceover for that film, as well as a sequence of poems. So I'm just going to read the first of four sections. The sea is spread and cleaved and furled. Are you happy? She asks. I'm happier, I say, and then, if you had to be an animal, which animal would you be? She cannot fit her mouth around the English for the animal she means. Have you ever been happy? She asks. She means a swan. She likes the way it wraps the long elegance of its neck around its lover until, like, forever. I don't think I've ever been happy, I say, and then if I had to be an animal, I'd be a zebra. A zebra is just a horse with stripes, I say. I can tell she was hoping for something more profound. I was hoping for something more profound, she says. In front of us, two cats are rolling on what used to be the grass. The cats are rolling in the heat. Beyond the ground gives to cliffs. It gives to the Tyrrhenian sea. I think too much, she says. It's one of my problems. Let's play a game, I say. My skin itches on raw heat. What type of game, she says. Let's make a list of all our problems, I say. You go first, she says. We drink meloncello for breakfast. I make a silent list of my problems. I'm thinking which ones would sound like burr sincerity. I say, I'm thinking which would sound like super vulnerable. I'm thinking which would sound sincere, but also like, oh, that's super cute. You're a good me, I say. That dude with the gut behind the counter, he's a bad me, I say. She's snoring gently. She's a good me snoring with elegance. The man with the gut brings coffee. Cardi B is a good me, I say. Leonard Cohen is a good me, although he's dead, obviously. Michel Foucault is a bald me. Foucault is a bald me that looks like Doc Brown. Michael J. Fox is a metaphor for my own inevitable decline in the sense that another's misfortune is actually always about me. Chris Brown 
is a terrible me, I say. She's wearing my underwear. She's purring like a hedgehog. You snore like a hedgehog, I say. She's embarrassed. The taupe of her cheek flits rouge. This is what I want, I say. What, she asks, to watch you blush, I say. The sea is cold and we are so very drunk. The sea is cold and she is not here. The sea is cold and we are spread out on a hot rock. The sea is spread and cleaved and furled by the relentless heft of a tanker. I'm on a tanker and a drunk Estonian rigger is sleeping on my shoulder. I'm on a ship sidling into Sicily. I'm on a ship that grinds and bumps against the Spanish waves. I'm on a ship watching the water break and acquiesce and sew itself back together again. That's what I want, I say. What, she asks. I want to feel you give, I say. That sounds hot, she says. You're always thinking about sex, I say. Will you sew me back together, she says. Probably not, I say. And then I say, are any of us really anything other than gaping wounds? Are any of us more than a patch of weakened bone? That's dark, she says. I know, I say. And then I only love my bed and my mama. I'm sorry, I say, because citing North American hip hop artists is something I do, I say. It's something I do to ease the tension. It's something I do with the kind of irony you should read as sincerity, I say. This isn't cynicism, she says. No, I say. Or if it is, I say. It's also love, it's also love, I say. It's also love in the way your boot on the head of a kitten you dunked with your fender is a kind of love, I say. In the way sometimes when you're making a hollandaise sauce and it splits, you launch the electric whisk so that the plug snaps right out of the wall and the whisk crosses your open plan kitchen. The whisk spins and glides and spanks the living room wall and you pick up the whisk and you kneel down and you start to thrash and gash the antique parquet floor until it splinters and the whisk is little more than mauled plastic and the sawdust of the floor is beginning to float gently in the tiny puddles of your hot tears. It's a bit like that, I say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aaron. And we're now going to come together for a discussion. So um, if everyone would like, like to turn on their screens and their audio. Uh, we can have a talk together. Um, and Brenda, we still have to see. Brenda, thank you. Thank you coming, for coming back. Um, Aaron's just finished, and uh, it occurred to me, I did plug Brenda's live readings next week. Um, you, you've got an event coming up in London, haven't you, Aaron, for this book? Yeah, Friday, a gallery called TJ Bolting, uh, Friday the 21st at 6.30. Right, thanks. Okay. Well, um, to kick off the discussion, um, it seems to me that all three of you are exploring the self in your books, but there's sometimes a thin line between exploring the self and exhibiting the self. And so I was wondering whether any of you would like to comment on that. Um, how much there's a, how, how do you not lapse into narcissism? Um, you may be using irony like Aaron does or um, tenderness as Jen does or passion and honesty as, as, um, as Brenda does. W would you like to come back on that and discuss it? Who'd like to start? I Jen? mean, I think I, yeah, I can jump in. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny. I mean, it's become like various memes on Twitter. If you follow like poetry Twitter, the like um, 
me versus the speaker of my poems. Um, there's a great one where it's like a photo of a cow looking out to the sea. <laughs> and it's like, this is the speaker of my poems. Um, but I also kind of <laughs> love um, just saying that the speaker is me <laughs> um, often, although it's a version, right? It's a selection, it's an exaggeration at times. Um, where I'm leaning into like certain qualities of it. Um, but it's funny just even like the language um, with this question, like examination versus exhibition. Um, so I do think I <laughs> have some exhibitionist tendencies um, in life and in writing. Um, so I think part of it for me is also examining that tendency or, or that impulse. So it's also examining the display of the self at the same time. Um, and so I'm always telling students this as well. It's like, oh, if you have an anxiety over something that's going on in your work, if you're like, oh, is this indulgent? Is this narcissistic? Is this um, you know, too self-involved or something? Like bring that question into the work itself because that might actually be something you need to look at more closely um, or let it like surprise you, right? By bringing it in um, instead of trying to always dodge it. Um, so yeah, that's often my approach too. Aaron, your your book is very me, 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 but it's also not just look at me, it's, it's kind of self-hatred as well as self-pity. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the book is, is again, the, that thing between expression and exhibition. I mean, this book particularly is kind of interested in a, in a self that, that uh, gets so aware of the performance of yourself that, it, that, that the idea of a self starts to disintegrate into very little book performance. Um, and it's a, it's a book, I guess, that's interested in, in writing on that line between performance as kind of you know, it's just something we all do as um, legitimate form of expression. And on the one hand, and also where it becomes a kind of facade. Um, and it's, and, the, and hopefully, although it is quite a narcissistic book, um, hopefully, and a quite neurotic book, um, but hopefully it undercuts that um, by, by constantly pointing to its own forms of performance. Um, I mean, I think what's really interesting reading Chen's and Brenda's book is how, it, I mean, and Neil already touched on it, but there's this sense of dialogue in Chen's work where the self is 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 constructed through dialogue, which is at the same time assertive, but also tender and also loving. And it's amazing. And then in Brenda's work, there's this, um, this kind of amazing way that the self just kind of takes on a trajectory. They kind of, you know, a trajectory where there's, I mean, especially in the later work, where in the longer poems where, um, you just you can feel this kind of intelligence moving through its expression and then just like twi like twitching and shifting paths, which is incredible. And you're also in both your books, you're also talking to someone else, aren't you? I mean, Chen, um, whether it's autobiographical or not, he's talking to his lover or to his family and you're talking to your lover or your ex-lover. Um, how, how do you... Um, manage that in in personal terms i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if i do <laughs> um it's just um how i write yeah it's often yeah it is dialogue um a lot of um ideas images lines um the sense of play, yeah, comes from conversation with people that I'm close to, um, and that might include that I'm in conflict with as well, uh, especially when it comes to family. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of conversation, and I was thinking a lot in this book about um, like technologies of communication as well, right? Like the emergency contact, the phone. Um, I was just talking with a friend about this the other day, how funny it is that we still say like, hang up, um, even though you're just like pressing a button, right? So it's like the physical gesture itself has actually changed, but we still use the language, which was once literal, it's now become figurative. And so the um, vocabulary around communication is really interesting to me too. Um, 
but yeah, that's just because I used to not. I used to like keep out kind of actual dialogue um, and how I would actually talk to people, but the poems were less alive actually because of that um, kind of denial of the self denial of everyday life. Um, they're really like hermetically sealed. Um, and then once I let more of the world in, um, right, that happened a lot through conversation, the poems really changed. Let's bring Brenda in here. The conversation aspect of it's really important because when I, I don't necessarily see these books as being like me, 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 or look at me or whatever, it's sort of like, I see people desperate, to, myself included, to be, to be heard and to be able to say reality the way I see it the way it feels to me. And it's not because one likes the sound of one's own voice, although that's not not there. But the reality is that I, I want to be joined by others. I want to, I want to, I want to be in this conversation. I want, I, 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 in many ways, uh, to sort of speak the actual feelings and the, maybe the uncomfortable things and to sort of exhibit some of this stuff that I'm going through is a way to actually protect my privacy while also reaching out because I'm because I'm framing it right I can protect my privacy because I'm the one who's saying what part is revealed and what's not um and that's where the craft of poetry comes in you're actually you're the one who's constructing that um opacity or that transparency and um and so in many ways it's like being able to have that creation and then to be able to sort of stick a hand around it and be like, come join me, come here with me. Do you hear this? Do you hear me? Like, and that's what I, I see. I see that very much in these two books. Like, come with me, you know, like I'm talking to my, my lover. I'm talking to my, you know, to my, my ex and that absence, you're intercepting it. So you're here with me. And it's like, you know, we're lonely. <laughs> I don't know. I've been so lonely. Haven't you? Um, so I think that it's kind of like, like poetry, we've gotten it, but there's this way where we can actually, I think all of us, I, I was enthralled reading these books. I felt like, yeah, this is a way of like speaking your truth, but also like, like, I mean, finding community is such an easy way to put that, right? But like, it's like saying, come here, you, you come here, you like this? You like what I'm saying? Come talk to me, because I want to hear you now. It really feels like, you know, like, I don't know, making... I don't know, international friends, like making electronic, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's some, some particular to poetry way of, of connecting on a mind level. Um, it's not necessarily, and that seems like the opposite of exhibitionism. It's not just what you see, what you're presenting, but like meet me in my brain. Mm. Well, also it's, it's kind of, you know, it's like one of the oldest ideas is this idea that we learn about ourselves or we exist or we, we we embody ourselves in dialogue with other people, right? Like we're like we're not very interesting people if we just if we're just on our own, you know. So like we need we need we learn about ourselves. We we actually exist in dialogue with other people, and and I think in in some ways all three of these books are, are, are kind of writing into that dialogue. And and obviously there is a tradition and historically in poetry in which the lyric poem is a kind of utterance of an I. And often without, you know, like if you think about kind of, you know, late 19th century, early 20th century poetry, like an utterance of I with almost a disregard to the other. And like that's not actually that interesting. And none of these books is doing that. It's 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 a bit more of a kind of human mode of of reflection or awareness, I think. In in your book, Aaron, you also use the lowercase I throughout, don't you? It's you're not doing any Cummings, but you have. I is always lowercase. Is that a kind of very self-consciously part of that preoccupation? It is in the first sequence. I mean, the first sequence, I think it might become a tick after the first sequence. I think it might have just become something I did aesthetically. But in the first sequence, it's a super uh, purposeful thing. You know, like the I is, is quite unstable throughout the first sequence. It's a, it's a kind of way of signifying that I'm not really sure what, who the I is in the first sequence. And I think I think there are poems in which the I is capitalized, especially in the last sequence, where there's a bit more resolution. But um, yeah, I mean, it was it was a kind of graphic way of slightly minimizing that big I that so much of old poetry relies on, right? Yeah, that's how I took it. It was a kind of way of balancing that. Yeah. Um, can I ask you about change? Because um, 
it seems to me that your work shows change through all your books. Uh, maybe we should kick off with um, Brenda on that because her book covers five previous collections and new work. And over that period, your work has gone through various changes. I was wondering, Brenda, putting together this selection, uh, how aware you were of those different phases and how you see the, the five books moving from one into the other. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a portrait of a, of a life, pretty much. I mean, it's, they always say that thing of your first book takes your whole life up until that point to write, and you're using your material from your whole life to write that first book. And so the second book is like, what, I got to write about the last two years, that's it? <laughs> that's not enough material. But, um, but yeah, I think um, having a little more compassion for that young poet that I was, I was awfully hard on her, you know, at the time. And then as I progressed in my life, I felt like I, I really, I didn't want to sound, it's funny, people always worry about sounding like themselves or whether they have a signature voice or whatever, but, you know, like, like people always say too, wherever you go, there you are, you kind of can't lose your voice. Like people, you can do something that people don't like you to write, but, and you can change your style. And someone might say, I don't love it, but who cares? Um, it's, it's, it comes essentially from you and you're the one living that life. I think that the one thing that came up about um, in my third book is I, I felt like no matter who reads this, no one's ever, it's not going to ever get back to the people I'm writing about. So I can use their real names, right? And so I use people's real names and it totally came back. And um, it's just on some of it's a little gossipy and I probably should have changed those names. And that's sort of funny and goofy, but then I also started using my children's names and my partner's name. And now I'm like, should I have, I maybe shouldn't have done that. I don't, I don't know. Um, all this is to say is that everything changes, you know, like both everything changes in terms of what you're thinking about and decisions you made. I go back and I edit old, old but, poems. But in, in our Andromeda, you would have had to have used ridiculous. Your, yeah. In our Andromeda, you would have to have used your son's name, wouldn't you? Because of how that whole book worked. I, yeah, I did, but then I continued to, you know, mm. um, and then I'm like, wait a minute, isn't this a thing? Aren't parents like not supposed to do this? I don't know. I mean, the, the rules change too. So it's not like I can keep up with everything. What occurred to me in the end, I'm going to stop talking in the end was that I really want to only write what I want to write. Um, and that's, that seems obvious, but there was a, a, a long time in my life where I felt like I needed to write what, I, not, not that I was supposed to write it, but that like, what would I write if I was going to write something kind of idea, you know, what, what, would, what would be the thing that I would write next? And it was a kind of like, and I finally just decided like I don't care if it's sloppy I don't care if it's messy I don't care if it's half-assed maybe that's what I want to write and it just sort of was very freeing because I felt like I had to be very tight very polished like it had to be perfect I had to be I had to be so incredibly smart you know like god forbid someone thinks you're stupid like now I kind of feel like maybe I could write something stupid it's kind of liberating mm. Jen your 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 work started out being about your difficulties of being a young queer boy growing up in the States with Chinese parents and the problems you have with school, the family and all that kind of thing. And it's developed, it's flowered. I mean, I say flowered looking at the backdrop behind you. It's really flowered from there into something on another level, hasn't it? I hope so. <laughs> a lot, a lot uh, more, and the humour in particular has got quite elaborate. Yeah, it has. Um, yeah, I think this new book is both darker and funnier, and um, the two really <laughs> feed each other, right? Like, the best comedy often comes from tragedy or you know, difficulty. Um, so I, I love layering that kind of tonal complexity. But yeah, I had a lot of anxiety um, 
after the first book um as Brenda said like you know your whole life up to that point and then it's like and then why <laughs> I was really like how do people keep doing this it just seems like kind of an insane thing to do with your life um which maybe it is but in like a delightful way at the same time so um yeah it took me a while like I was partly glad that I was in a PhD program and so busy um even though it was kind of really stressful <laughs> in other ways um but I kind of had to just like you know take classes and teach and do all these other things and prepare for the first book coming out um so it kept me from spiraling too much I think because I was really worried initially um about what direction I would go in next and I had this strong itch to really depart from what that first book was um because I was like I'm sick of looking at this thing sick of writing about myself sick about writing about family let me do something completely different but then everything that was coming out um when I would write that was you know worth a damn was about those subjects <laughs> and so I'm like oh right your obsessions choose you and you know your task as a writer is not to ignore those obsessions but to be really aware of them and to try to examine them from all sorts of other angles right and bring other kind of formal um devices and bring other imagination right, to those subjects and themes. So that's, yeah, where I ended up kind of pushing things. And so um, I try other things in terms of um, line and sentence and where the images go, but also the settings are quite different, right? I mentioned just writing about and from West Texas. And so that landscape, um, really affected things as well. And ultimately I was, I was glad for that, although it was also quite an adjustment living there. Um, but yeah, so that, yeah, there's just a lot of anxiety. Took some time to get over. I think I'm doing better now, <laughs> but who knows what's, you know, what's next, so. Aaron, you started out as a kind of the wunderkind of British poetry, your first book. This is now your fourth. And your work has become much more engaged with contemporary culture, mm -hmm. with the whole vulgarity of modern life, which you embrace at the same time as you attack it. Um, how, how do you see those phases that you've gone through in your work? Um, I think, I think for, for, for better or worse, I have a, I don't know if it's a poor attention span or what it is, but I have an inability to write the same kind of book. So, so you write the first book, really. The first two books were quite formally tight and quite formally uh, in, intense and, and in, in many ways quite uh, lived in a world of kind of high cultural illusion. Um, and I, I, you know, I mean, all of those things I still enjoy, um, but I just don't want to do the same book again and again. Um, and... Uh, I think it's interesting to do a book in which you, I mean, this book is so much looser, I think, even than the last book, you know, I mean, the last book had these long lines, which this one uses, but but the kind of tonality of this is so much uh, freer, partly through writing in, in response to, or in, in dialogue to working in film um, and working in sequences like this. Um, but, you know, I mean, I was joking to a, a friend actually the, the other day, I was saying, you know, or maybe the next book will be a book of sonnets or a, a book of villanelles, you know. It's like, for me, it's more like, it's it's finding a form to fit what the book is about. And it's kind of like, you know, the, I also, I mean, I don't know whether this feels like some kind of superstition, but I kind of feel like the form of the book is going to be what it's going to be. And you can write what you can write at that moment. Um, and and the only thing I know is that every book is is quite a departure from the one before so I'm not sure whether you can see a trajectory except towards increasing looseness and maybe increasing vulgarity um, although there are poems in the first book that are fairly vulgar too so you know 
Um, at this point in our discussions, we usually like to ask our poets who are taking part if there are things they'd like to ask each other, having read each other's books and uh, heard each other read. I was wondering whether any of you would like to chip in with anything you'd like to say to one of the others. I really want to know what both of you are reading. <laughs> reading. I mean, I know that our, our attention is shot and everything, but does anything like anything get through anything recent? I just, I just got really into um, this debut book called Casual Conversation by Renia White. It's like stunning. It's mm. stunning. And I just, I want, did, do you have anything recent like that? Cause I want to, I want to gobble it. Oh, well, what comes to mind? I mean, I've, I've been very slowly reading Victoria Chang's Dear Memory, um, the nonfiction book, also because I've just been thinking a lot about epistolary forms um, and how much I love them and why, and um, wanting to teach uh, a workshop all about letters and poems. Um, so that's one, and not recent, but I finally got. Um, Linda Gregg's um, All of It Singing, um, the selected volume. And it's just incredible, <laughs> as I'm sure many people know. But um, I have been like reading her work here and there on social media for a while. And I was like, okay, got a new library card, saw the book, ready to go. Yeah. And anything you'd like to pitch in? I mean, I was, I was at a reading recently by a, a small publisher called Monitor Books in London. It's probably this amazing reading. I mean, I knew Nisha Ramaya's work quite well, but not not that well. And there was this amazing double, I mean, it was a triple reading, uh, a poem called Holly Pester. It was amazing. And then a film work by Elizabeth Price, uh, who won the Turner Prize and and... But it was essentially a long poem, uh, and it was kind of stunning. It was like absolutely stunning. And then Nisha Ramaya read after it, and and so I was going back to her last book, which is "States of the Body," produced by Love. I think I think that's the one I'm thinking of, um, and and thinking about that book a lot. But also just thinking about that particular conversation in Elizabeth Price's work, which is video, but so often incredibly, incredibly literary um, at the same time, and it, and and. Yeah, I mean, those are the two things that come to mind at the moment. Anything, any of you want to pick up about each other's work tonight? You'd like to respond yeah. as well. I want to ask um, Brenda, but also Erin, um, like about just picking what to read from multiple books. Um, and Brenda, I'm so glad you read um, the Artless Poem, also the Sisters one, those have been favorites of mine for a long time. I love teaching those as well. Um, but yeah, just, yeah, looking over so many poems. Yeah, that's books. why this that's why this um, volume is really such, such an exciting thing because I can just read from it and go through all these different parts. And, and how do I pick them? Yeah, in a way it's kind of like, those are my like, I have like three hits. <laughs> I have three hit poems. <laughs> Those are two of them. So I sort of do that. Um, especially when I'm feeling like I don't, especially when it's, when we're sort of removed sensorily a little bit, like when we're mm. on, on camera, it's not the same thing yeah. as being together where like different things can happen and I feel more experimental. But yeah, um, I, I was listening to what you were saying, Chen, about feeling like you got sick of your uh, your first book and now, but then you read from this one and you don't go back to the old book probably in readings, in, in new readings, right? Um, I mean, do you feel that way, Erin? Do you feel like you don't go back to the original ones and you sort of are always like, you're promoting this book. So this is the one you're reading from. Yeah, I find it hard to read all, from all the books. I mean, there are poems I like in all the books, but I still find it hard to read them. Um, it's always the newest thing. In many ways, I think it takes some of the pressure off. I feel like, I feel like maybe... Okay, okay, honestly, it's probably something like, I am not, I'm insecure about the new work. And I read, I, I sort of like try to go back to the old, but then it feels kind of canned and then I try to like push myself. I'm still, it's still very much a work in progress. I don't know what I'm doing. Even though I'm a, kind of a, a pro, I still don't know what I'm doing. Maybe that's my secret. I don't know. But isn't it also like the difference between, you know, you're selecting poems as a writer 
I mean, I was just thinking about this, listening to to Brenda's reading. So um, on the one hand, like I know for me, when I'm selecting poems to read as a writer, I'm always picking the newer stuff, right? Because it's what's, it's what's exciting to me. It's what I want to read. And then I was just so pleased you read Nacht, Nacht Trink, look, the Kite. I don't know, I can't, can't pronounce it because it's just such an amazing poem. And it's from the middle of this, right? It's page, I looked it up, it's page 94. Um, so, so like as a, as a, as an audience member, I was so pleased you read that poem. But I think as writers, it's kind of like we don't, or I certainly don't want to go back and read older work that much. Well, I did, you know, I, in many ways, the choice of these poems were, were in response, you know, they were very much in response to your books. I mean, I, I don't know if you did this, but I, I like was listening and reading along and then kind of like re reordering my set list according to what I was hearing. So I, I was sort of hearing and there's, there's kind of a, I wasn't trying to like respond to, but, um, but when Chen was reading this, I remember, I remember, remember this amazing poem that you read that I just loved in the, in the book and hearing it, it was just stunning. Um, but then I, that's when I sort of, you know, sort of decided um, which, which poem to read at the very end. It's sort of, um, I think Mark Doty told me once that like, you can't really, and this is why the, um, when, when we have to bring our, um, deliver our, our, our poems to venues before the event, you just sort of get it set in stone so that people can do the signing. Um, ahead of time, it's hard because it's hard for me to, um, to decide ahead of time because I feel like it can't, it's canned. I feel like I tend to sort of fall into a reading a script kind of thing instead of sort of feeling like I'm going, you know, going with the flow at the moment. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I often change my mind during as well. Um, and also, yeah, like hearing other folks read. And have you ever made a terrible mistake and realized halfway you're like, oh, I shouldn't have read this one. I, this is the wrong, this has that ever happened? It's terrible. Um, yes, I have. <laughs> um, but also, yeah, poems tend to be on the shorter side. <laughs> so I'm like, well, at least they'll be over in like a minute. <laughs> and then I will switch gears properly from there. <gasps> yeah. Well, thank you all very much. I think we can wind up our conversation there and let people go off and get their dinners or whatever. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, um, Jen Jen. Brenda Shaughnessy and Aaron Warner. And for people watching, just scroll down on the YouTube page and you can see links there to buy copies of their books. They won't be available yet on Amazon for a couple of days. You can order them from Blood Axe now, so please do. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.